Good morning again. If you are ready to dive in, you want to open your Bibles to the Gospel of John. That's where we are going to be uh, today, looking at just one verse, but uh, a lot of other verses to go along with it. Have you ever noticed that there are a lot of things in life that seem impossible? Have you all ever faced something you thought was impossible? Anybody? Just me? Okay, good. Everybody's with me on this. You know, just a few years ago, I can remember when the idea of putting a human being on Mars seemed impossible. And I don't know if you've been following this journey and the news and what all is going on uh, with that, but, but now it seems highly probable that that is going to actually happen in our lifetimes. People are going to be living on another planet. At, at one point in human history, people would stand around and watch birds flying around, and they, they probably thought, man, that would be cool if we could do that. But that's impossible. And, and now, it's, it's impossible now to imagine a world without air travel, isn't it? It's impossible now to imagine a world where we can't just zoom around anywhere we want to go on an airplane. Not, not long ago, in fact, in many of our lifetimes, the idea of an internet would have been impossible for us to, to comprehend. It would have been an impossible concept for most of us to grasp and get our minds around. But today, the internet affects everything in our lives, doesn't it? If you don't believe me, just think about how crazy your life gets when the internet goes down or when you lose cell service for a day, right? You know what else seems impossible for a lot of people? And I think we miss this. We know this because for many of us it seems impossible too, but, but the idea of peace seems impossible. And I'm not talking about world peace. I'm talking about personal peace peace. Our world is dominated more and more by fear, anxiety, stress, and panic, chaos. It's easy in, in our world to be fearful. There are so many things in our world that can cause us to have those kinds of emotions which, which all center out of and find their genesis in fear. But if the cross of Christ teaches us anything, it's this, and it's our big idea for today. It teaches us that peace is possible. Peace is possible. There on Calvary, there was a, a collision between peace and fear. And can I just give you the end of the story? Peace prevails. Peace wins. But the reality is, 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 is that's not a reality for many of us today. The reality is peace is not what is prevailing in the lives of most believers today. How many of you have an app on your phone that has the Bible on it? Or iPad or tablet or whatever? Okay, if you have your hands up, how many of you have uh, the version Bible app? It's called, it's got a little holy Bible. Okay, many of you. Some of y'all are using other stuff. That's, that's fine. YouVersion is, is probably the most popular um, Bible app out there, and I'm not endorsing it. I'm not telling you to go and get it. But, but every year, YouVersion does this thing where they publish the top verses that are searched by people within their app. Now, what you have to keep in mind about this app is it's used by Christians. This isn't an app that's predominantly, I'm sure some do, but it's not an app predominantly that atheists are using. It's not an app that predominantly agnostics are using. It's not an app predominantly that Muslims or people that follow Buddha or, or, or whatever else are using. This is an app that people who proclaim to be Christians, who desire to search and read and be in the Word of God, use. And, and I want to give you the top 10 verses for last year in their app. The first one is Isaiah 41.10. It says this, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. You know, the interesting thing about that verse 
is that verse has actually been the top verse, search verse, in the U, Uversion app three out of the last four years. Jeremiah 29, 11 came in second last year, for I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declarations, plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Verse 12 says, you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Romans 8, 28 was the third most searched for verse last year in their app. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God who are called according to his purpose. Coming in at number four was Matthew 6, 33 through 34, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Joshua 1, 9 was the fifth most searched for verse. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Philippians 4, 8, 9, number 6. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything of moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. Number seven was 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in the proper time, casting all your cares on him, because he cares about you. Philippians 4, 13 was number eight. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Number nine was 2 Timothy 1, 7, which says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. And coming in a distant tenth was John three sixteen. For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. You know what all ten of those verses have in common? They have one thing in common. All ten of those verses are about finding peace overcoming fear and worry and placing your confidence in Christ in a search for peace. You know, when I was reading through this list, you know, I, it was like I was conflicted because on one hand, it's really great to know that believers are seeking the word of God in times of distress. But on the other hand, it's somewhat discouraging and if I'm just being honest, concerning to know that our need for reassurance is so high in the area of peace that the top 10 verses searched on probably the most popular Bible app in the world are all about finding peace. My prayer for this message today is that everyone who hears it will leave with complete confidence in the eternal peace that is provided by Christ through his cross. When it comes to peace versus fear, there's no competition. Peace wins. And yet I know for many of you, peace may seem impossible today. But the reality is with Jesus, peace is possible. Our text is in John 14, where Jesus says these words in verse 27. He says, peace... I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled or fearful. This, this verse comes in the middle of a string of extremely important and very pointed instructions and assurances for the disciples. Just like each and every one of us, we have to understand the original disciples of Christ had a lot to be fearful of. And Jesus wanted them to know that peace was possible. He wanted them to understand that they could have peace even in the middle of great chaos and turmoil 
which would surround their lives for the rest of their lives. As we look at this verse, we see three simple things that remind us of how possible peace actually is. The first is what I call a sustaining surprise. A sustaining surprise. You see, this proclamation of peace from Jesus was likely an unexpected proclamation by the disciples. In the day of Christ, the most common way to say goodbye was with the word peace. When Jesus says in verse 27, peace, I leave with you, there is a foreshadowing here of the cross contained in these words. Jesus is saying goodbye, or beginning to. It's unclear if the disciples really pick up on it or not, but as you read further into the text, you get the sense that it would have been really hard for them not to pick up on this. As you read into the text, it's hard for me to imagine that they at the very least didn't have a few among them who took notice of the context of the way Jesus says all of this. Certainly we can see it today because we have all of the context and we have the benefit of hindsight. But but I just want to read a little bit deeper here. Look at verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled or fearful. Now look at verse 28. You have heard me tell you I'm going away. And I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. Verse 29, I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you may believe. I will not talk with you much longer, he says in verse 30, because the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me. On the contrary, so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do as the Father commanded me. Get up, he says, let's leave this place. Jesus specifically says, don't be troubled, don't be fearful. He says, I'm going away and I'm coming to you, which must have seemed a little bit of strange for him to say those two things back to back. We don't have time to get into that today. But then he says, I'm going to the Father I'm not going to talk with you and be here with you much longer. And then he says, the ruler of the world is coming. I'm leaving, and he's coming, but he has no power over me, so don't don't worry too much about that. I, I don't know about you, but if I was one of the disciples, all of those things would have certainly raised some concerns in my heart. They would have produced some level of, of fear and uncertainty and anxiety inside of me. And I have to believe when Jesus started with peace, I leave with you, some of the disciples would have woken up to that because they know this is the way you say goodbye. The statement may have been, most likely was very surprising, but the promise was sustaining. Nothing can sustain you like the peace of God. Nothing will sustain you in all of your life like the complete and total peace that only God can give you. The psalmist said it like this in Psalms 4.8. He said, I will both lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, Lord, make me live in safety. And we could look at dozens of other psalms with that same theme in them. Jesus himself says in John 16.31, Do you now believe? Indeed, an hour is coming and has now come when each of you will be scattered to his own home, and you will leave alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I think that would create a little bit of anxiety in me. And then in verse 33, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace, a sustaining peace. And then his very next words are, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous, I have conquered the world. In other words, not everything's going to be glamorous and glorious for you. Not everything is going to be easy for you. You will have suffering, but you can still have peace. Because my peace will sustain you no matter what you're going through. He wanted them to have peace. He wanted them to know that peace was possible. Paul closes his letter to the 
Thessalonians with these words. In 2 Thessalonians 3.16, it says, May the Lord of peace, may the Lord himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with all of you. My friends, he, Jesus, is our sustaining peace. Look at Romans 15, 13. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peace is possible. His peace is surprising, and it is sustaining. His peace is possible, but only if it comes from Him. This isn't peace like the world gives us or offers us or attempts to give us. This is a sustaining, surprising peace. The second thing we see about this peace is that it comes from a supernatural source. This peace is not of this world. Church, I I really want you to hear this because I think this is maybe the, the part of the puzzle that many people are missing. The peace you really need in your life, you can't pick up at the store. The peace you're looking for and you're, you're after, you, you can't walk up to the counter and order it with your bucket of fried chicken. It's not going to come from there. You, you can't get it from a medicine cabinet. You can't get online and buy this kind of peace. You can't produce this peace. You can't make it yourself. You can't put all of your effort and time and energy into it and think you're going to find the peace you're looking for. You can't go out in the back of your ranch or in some national forest somewhere and set a trap and catch you some of this peace. You're not going to trap it. You're not going to find it on social media. It's it's not going to be there. I know you're spending hours and hours scrolling and thumbing and looking through social media. Peace is not there. You're not going to find it on the evening news or on cable TV. You cannot download or upload it from a link in your email. True peace comes from a supernatural source. And this is exactly why, church, you can be rich and not have peace. It's why you can be famous and not have peace. It's why you can be healthy and not have peace. It's why you can be loved by everybody, everywhere, and still have no peace in your heart. It's why you can be incredibly intelligent and smart and have all kinds of pieces of paper and articles and be published and everybody look to you as being the smartest person in the whole world and you can still lack peace. You can even be as athletic as I am. Well, let's not get too carried away. You probably will never be that athletic. For our radio listeners, that's sarcasm. But you get the point, right? None of that stuff is going to bring you real peace. Now, peace is possible, but, but it's not possible from the things of this world. It's, it's a supernatural source that brings peace into our life. Jesus says in verse 27, peace, I leave with you my peace. I give to you. This peace only comes from Christ. It's his peace to give. The source of your peace, the source of my peace, is Jesus. Real peace can't come from any other source. We can't manufacture it or make it. It is manifested through the power of the gospel and the goodness of God. I want you to look at this verse in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, which says this. Perhaps this is the verse in the New Testament to me that makes this idea the clearest. He says in verse 15, And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. His peace is something you are called into. 
You don't find it, you don't buy it, you don't make it, you don't get lucky and just bump into it on the street one day. You are called into it as a child of God. Peace is possible, but only with Jesus. Peace is possible, but not without Jesus, because he is the supernatural source from which all peace flows and all peace comes. The last part of this verse is point number three. It's what I call the the steadfast stance. There's an encouragement here, church, at the end of this verse, an encouragement for you and an encouragement for me. It was an encouragement then when the disciples heard it, and it's an encouragement straight from the lips of Jesus now to you and I, modern-day disciples. Listen to what he says here at the end of verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. And then he says this, I do not give to you as the world gives, praise God. He says, don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. To a large degree, we all have the ability to choose what we decide to focus on in life. Let me just be clear here. We don't have the ability to choose what we will face in life. A lot of things we face are not of our choosing. If we could choose everything we face, none of us would ever face tragedy. None of us would ever have cancer. None of us would ever have a marriage that falls apart, right? Right? None of us would ever have children that, that, that go off and become prodigals. If we could choose what we faced, our lives would be better. We don't get to choose what we face, but we can choose, no matter what we're facing, what we focus on. We have the capacity to choose what we focus on, no matter what we're facing. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, don't let your heart be troubled or fearful, not because you're not going to face anything that's going to scare you, not because you're not going to ever face anything that's going to bring anxiety into your life. He's saying, don't let your heart be troubled or fearful because no matter what you face, you focus on me. And you know and understand that peace is possible because I am the supernatural sustaining force behind it. See, Jesus, I really believe this, Jesus knew that his departure from earth and his violent, gruesome death on the cross was going to be a reason for great concern, fear, and anxiety for his disciples, these men that he's speaking to. So he says, don't let your hearts be troubled or fearful. I I think we miss how gruesome and awful that day was when they watched their friend and this man they've been following and witnessing do all of these miracles gasping for air gurgling as his own blood fills his lungs as he bleeds raw from the beating with thorns in his head So gruesome, so awful, so fearful, and so filled with anxiety was that day, most of them didn't even attend while he was there on the cross. They fled and scattered and hid. Jesus is not saying, hey guys, this is going to be easy. He doesn't say this is going to be supernatural. Um, When I say, I don't mean supernatural, I mean Natural. He, he's not saying you're going to just naturally fall into this state where you're not going to be scared. He's saying you've got to remember where to focus. Don't, don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. What are you going to focus on? What are you going to let your heart focus on? That means we're going to have to work at it. It means we're going to have to be steadfast in our stance of trusting the Lord who is the supernatural sustaining force behind the peace that is possible through him. I always pray that the Lord will will give me practical things in my messages, things you can take home, not just good things to say, because it's it's easy, it's really easy, y'all, to stand up here and say, be steadfast in your stance. Focus on Jesus. Don't Don't let your hearts be troubled or fearful. That's easy to say and easy to preach about. But the question is, how do we do it? 
How do we do that practically in the world in which we live? How do we do that in the middle of incredible hardship? How do we do that in the middle of persecution at, the, at our school or our workplace? How do we do that as we're grieving the loss of a child or a spouse? How, how do we do that when we can never seem to get ahead and, and we're always fighting literally to just stay above the poverty line and make it every month? How, how do we do that when we're facing pain and tragedy? How do we do that when we're an emotional wreck? And even though we look good on the outside, we know deep down on the inside we're in some deep, dark, emotional turmoil in our own life. How do we do it? I mean, it's easy to say it. But church, judging by the top 10 most searched scriptures last year, we're not doing a very good job of actually doing it. So I, I started praying and thinking about the, the times in my life that I was most fearful and most filled with anxiety and the practical things that helped me the most in those times. And this isn't really supposed to be a comprehensive list, but I just wanted to leave you with four things that you can do right now if your fear is colliding with God's peace. If you just need something practical to do, I think these four things are a good place to start. Number one, the thing that, that, that has helped me a lot in these times is, is that I pray for peace. I pray now, I'm not, I'm not talking about like, like a, a Miss America contestant here. Like, I'm not talking about just praying generally for world peace. I mean, that would be nice. It would be great. I'm not saying we can't pray for it. But what I'm saying is that when fear and anxiety are colliding with God's grace and God's peace in my life, we, we should be praying a lot. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. It'll help you know what to focus on. God's peace is always present, but when we pray about something, something special happens in those moments. That, that peace becomes sharper, and we're able to experience it in a real tangible and very dynamic way as we spend time with the Lord. So if, if fear is colliding with the peace that you know is possible, I want to encourage you to just pray. Just go and be with your Father. Maybe, maybe you don't even say anything. You don't have to say anything even when you're praying. Just go into that secret place where it's only you and the Lord and sit in silence and just say, God, I'm here and I just need to be close to my daddy for a little while. Peace is possible. Next, I think we have to practice surrender. And this is a hard one. I mean, most of us aren't very good at this. I'm not saying I'm very good at this. It can be hard to surrender, and it can be hard to submit. But if we want to find peace, I mean, if we want to find the peace of God that surpasses all understanding in our lives, if we want to experience the kind of peace that the gospel promises us, we have to surrender, church. If you think about it, that's exactly what Jesus did when he went to the cross. He surrendered. There were two thieves that died on two crosses on either side of Jesus. And you know what the great difference between the two of them is? One of them surrendered and submitted and the other one didn't. In Luke 23, 42, that thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Can you imagine the peace that guy must have felt in that moment? Because he chose to surrender his life. The difference between that thief and the other was surrender. Surrender. Many times the difference between fear and anxiety and peace in my life has been my willingness to surrender whatever it is I'm worried about to the Lord. Can, can I just tell you this? And, and this isn't just a saying, it's not just cliche, it, it's truth. I've experienced it. 
with total surrender comes total peace. When we trust the Lord with it, we should be willing to surrender it. And when we surrender it and give him our greatest fears and worries and anxieties, when we truly surrender it to him, that's when we'll sense and feel the supernatural sustaining peace that he offers us. James offers us this advice in James 4, 7. He says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. When fear and peace collide, making the decision to submit and surrender to the will of the Lord will make all the difference in your life. Peace is possible if you'll surrender. The third thing is we need to pursue faithfulness. In the midst of these moments and times when, when we're worried and we're fearful and we're frightened and we're, we're, we're in that state where we just don't know if we can hold on any longer and we know peace is possible and we want peace, you know what we got to do? We have, we have to pursue faithfulness. And it's so easy, I know this from experience, it's so easy in these moments where we're the most worried and the most fearful, it's so easy right then and there to stop. To stop reading our Bible, to stop praying, to stop going to our small group, to stop attending Sunday worship regularly, to stop using our spiritual gifts for the glory of God. We stop doing all of the right things and we start doing all of the wrong things just really so we can feel sorry for ourselves. <laughs> so we can just get stuck in this depression and this rut of anxiety that if, if we're not careful, we can stay in for a very long time. So it's, it's extremely important, church, that even when we're afraid and fearful and filled with anxiety, especially when we're in those kind of moments in life, that we remain faithful in those uncertain times. When I think about what it means to remain faithful, even when things are hard and scary, I always think about that little church in Smyrna that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 2. Jesus sends a direct message to this church. He says this in verse 8. He says, Write to the angel of the church in Smyrna, Thus says the first and the last, the one who was dead and has come to life. He says, I know your affliction and poverty, but you are rich. He says, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. He says to this little church that's trying so hard, Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison and to test you, and you will experience affliction for 10 days. But he says, be faithful. Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. His message was simple, be faithful. Be faithful to the point of death. Fear always fades in the face of great faithfulness. But our worries and our fears and our anxieties multiply and grow when we stop being faithful. So we have to always pursue faithfulness. Peace, it is possible. And here's the last one, and this one's going to seem a little strange, particularly in light of the first three, but I think this one is so important we have to promote the gospel. Even, even in those moments, especially, I should say, in those moments where we're worried and we're fearful and it feels like the whole world is falling apart, we should make sure we are incredibly focused on promoting the gospel. I know that may sound strange, but it's exactly what Jesus encourages his church to do. Keep preaching the gospel. Keep telling others about my love. Keep telling others about my joy and my hope and my peace. Keep telling others about redemption and the fact that they can be saved from their sins. 
Guys, I don't think it's an accident that the final words Jesus spoke to his disciples were these. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after he had said this, it says, he was taken up as they were watching and a cloud took him out of their sight. Right before he goes to heaven, he says, <laughs> preach the gospel. Proclaim the gospel. This would have been, if I just put myself in the sandals of these disciples, this would have been one of the scariest moments of my life. Not because he floats up and, and goes into a cloud, but because he's gone. And he's left me here with this incredible mission. That would have created a lot of anxiety in my life. I don't know about y'all, but I would have been a little freaked out about it. And what does he tell them to do? He says, promote the gospel. If you want to have peace, then you have to be a promoter of the gospel. You have to share your faith. You have to share God's love. You have to share God's grace. Share God's heart with other people. Share God's incredible story of redemption not just because it's the last command that Jesus gives us as disciples. Not just because the Bible makes it clear we're supposed to do it. But because when we look at this in the context of what's happening in the lives of those he gives these words to, we can clearly see that he knew if they would remain focused on that, no matter what came their way, they were going to have peace. Peace is possible. Maybe, maybe you're here today, maybe you're listening online or on the radio today, and you don't have peace in your life. You don't have the peace of God in your life because you don't have a relationship with the Son of God. See, peace is possible, but it's only possible with Jesus. I have good news, you can have eternal peace. You can have it this very day. Because when the cross of Christ collided with fear, God left nothing in your way to get to peace. He cleared, if you will, the path to peace. I want you to consider the three most basic things the cross of Christ does for all of us, for me, for you, for everybody. If you want to just understand the cross, you have to understand these three things about it. Number one, it forgives all your sins. Forgives your past, your present, your future. It, it forgives your past. That, that brings peace. Number two, it provides for your present. It gives you everything you need for living today. And number three, it guarantees your future. It guarantees your future for all eternity. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're saved. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says nobody can snatch you out of our hand. You're safe. It forgives your past, it provides for your present, and it guarantees your future. That's why when your fear collides with the peace of God, it always loses. When your fear collides with the gospel, it always loses because the gospel, the cross, what Jesus did for you and for me in forgiving our past, in providing for our present, and in guaranteeing our future removes every barrier to peace. So if you have never called on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we're going to invite you to do that, to make a decision for him right now today, not by raising your hand or coming to the front, but just praying. Praying and repenting of your sins and believing and calling and confessing Christ today. Peace is possible with Jesus. Let's pray. If you're here and have never given your life to the Lord, or if you're online or on the radio, we invite you right now to pray with us, to cry out in repentance and great confession. To simply say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. And give me this great promise of eternal life. 
Wash me from the inside out. Make me pure as your word says you will. Lord, I thank you so much for your grace and your goodness. I thank you for forgiving me of my past, for providing for my present, and for guaranteeing my future through the cross. I thank you for making peace possible. Father, in the midst of impossible things, it is good to know peace is anything but impossible. It is a possible reality for every single person who understands what it is and where it comes from, who is willing to surrender and give it to you. So, Father, I pray for those who are struggling with it. I, I know it's not easy. I know it's hard to focus on the right things. I know it's, it's hard in the midst of fear to be faithful and to pursue it. Lord, I know personally it, it's hard. But I also know it's possible. And so, Lord, as we close today, I just pray that no matter where people are right now, those who have heard this message, Father, I pray they would never forget in their deepest, darkest, most desperate hour that even there, peace is possible because of you, because of your son, because of the cross. Father, we thank you for that assurance, that encouragement, and that truth this hour. 